It is disgusting, the agitation over thread in today's world. Ever since the ships from foreign countries came for the jeweled, silkworm cocoons to the land of the gods and the emperor, people's hearts, awesome though they are, are being pulled apart and consumed by rage. When discussing Shin Megami Tensei, a common complaint is that the games have poor writing. While I often disagree, I find this to be very understandable. It is true that the games aren't very descriptive. SMT storytelling focuses strictly on the key moments of a character's development, sometimes skipping over certain aspects of their broader personal journey, even more so in games where they represent the voice of a larger movement. This can evoke the feeling of the cast being less like people and more like objects. However, one thing that tends to be glossed over is that this is, or at least was, purposeful. When met with technical limitations, the devs rejected a sense of realism in favor of facilitating player imagination. For an easy example, let's take the main character of SMT1. He hardly, if ever, speaks, and outside of his clothes, he has no real defining features. The player was fully intended to project themselves onto this character. In fact, in an interview for the PS1 remake of the original Shin Megami Tensei, Koji, or Koji Okada, both programmer for SMT1 and co-founder of Atlas, mentioned that they actively decided not to add more descriptive scenes. They believe that these changes may have conflicted with how players previously envisioned the game. I bring all this up to make clear that at the very roots of the Shin Megami Tensei series is agency. The games put emphasis on the player to make decisions for themselves. How do you, the player, perceive the world? This is clearly shown through one of SMT's most iconic mechanics, the alignment system. As opposed to the smaller scale stories told in Persona or Devil Summoner, the conflicts in the mainline series involve directing society with your ideology. Part of what makes the original Shin Megami Tensei so interesting is that, more so than the other games, it makes clear and explicit calls to contemporary politics and culture. So if you know what you're looking for, there's a lot to dig into. The issue is that I, and I'm sure most of my viewers, are not Japanese and consequently have likely not been exposed to broader Japanese culture, and there's a lot of stuff in the game that can easily just go over your head as a western viewer. However, as being the first game would imply, its understanding of both religion and politics informed the games that came after. So to celebrate the series 30th anniversary, let's look back to 1990X and examine how it ties these symbols together to discuss the human condition and the state of modern society. One of the main focuses the staff had when designing the world of SMT was originality. This is made most clear in the game's aesthetic. SMT rejects the standard JRPG medieval fantasy setting for a grittier urban and eventually post-apocalyptic fantasy. This may be due to the fact that they weren't going out of their way to make an RPG. In the aforementioned Koji Okada interview, he notes that he simply thought that the genre would be the best way to express their ideas. He was personally heavily inspired by older RPGs like Wizardry. Likewise, the setting of Tokyo was influenced by a series of different media, such as the movie Mad Max and the manga Fist of the North Star. Ironically, the source of its unique identity is explicitly drawn from the dev team's favorite media, and if I had to pick one thing that influenced Shin Megami Tensei the most, it's Devilman, with it directly inspiring many ideas throughout the franchise. If you're familiar with the series, you may already know about SMT IF, with Akira Miyamoto and the demon Amon, but it's actually much deeper than that. To explain, Devilman is a story about the friends Akira Fudo and Ryo Asuka, attempting to stop an invasion of ancient demons from destroying human society. To this end, Akira fuses with the demon Amon to become the titular Devilman, because only the power of a demon can seriously challenge them. Now the reason I actually bring this up is to talk about its depiction of demons. In Devilman, demons are said to have ruled the earth during prehistory. They lived lives of mindless violence and their society was ruled by might makes right. To survive in these conditions, demons learned how to merge with other life forms, in turn stealing their abilities. While this helped them adapt, it warped their bodies into monstrous shapes. But God eventually saw what was happening on the earth and made a plan to wipe out all the demons. In response, they preemptively sealed themselves in ice so they could hibernate and prepare for the final battle. When the demons came back, they saw humans running around like they owned the place and hated them. Not just for controlling the planet, but for what they see as defiling it. So now the demons want to wipe out mankind. To start their attack, they begin to forcefully fuse into people en masse. However, 
Under normal circumstances, demons cannot successfully fuse with humans. This is because humans have reason, which is diametrically opposed to how demons function, and when the fusion fails, it leads to instant death for both parties. The demons purposefully chose this tactic because they realized humanity's biggest weakness was fear. Fear that at any moment you could suddenly fall over and die. Fear that literally anyone around you could be a demon in disguise. Blinded by this fear, governments around the world believe they have to start killing people before they can turn into demons. This means anyone who has a grievance with society, or in other words, disagrees with the powers that be. Riot squads start marching the street in every country, leading to several genocides of immigrants, ethnic minorities, and even protesters. Wars, both civil and international, are sparked worldwide, leaving no country at peace. In towns, local manhunts are held to drive out families suspected of harboring demons. People are so afraid of being accused of being a demon that they preemptively accuse others, and if you don't join the mob, it puts suspicion on you. The humans become so consumed by terror that they're killing themselves without the demons even doing anything. They become shells of themselves, with the faces of men but the heart of a demon, leaving Earth a living hell. Now, the meat of Devilman is that demons aren't just demons. In the manga, the scientist Renuma says, The desires and passions of the humans cause a mutation of their cellular structure. The delusion, frustration, and stress that lie in a human psyche start up a process that brings human cells to morph into ones of other beings. Among those of whom demon fusion was successful, it changes them not just physically, but mentally. It slowly begins to destabilize their mood, and over time, they become more and more violent as it seeps into their heart. This is because demons represent primal nature. As we said before, demons act mindlessly and without reason. However, they aren't just the primal nature of man, but that of the broader global ecosystem, coming to enact revenge on mankind for dominating the planet. The manga uses this abstract form of nature to represent a longing for the past in the face of anxiety towards the future. One character posits that rising spikes in population growth would cause food scarcity worldwide. He goes on to argue that in the pre-modern era, war was waged during famines and those served to redistribute food and control population size. However, now, with the invention of nuclear warfare, such a war could theoretically end mankind. In lieu of this, he wonders if humanity took the right direction. What if humankind was better off living as animals? Under natural law, everything has its place. X is eaten by Y and Y by Z. Demons would act as predators and be humans' population control. This being an allusion to social Darwinism, a social theory that believes in a constant struggle between ideas or peoples, and the prevailing between these is thus superior. It applies the basic idea of survival of the fittest to both economics and politics. But to be clear, the manga does not advocate this. The demons having grotesque forms is meant to show that this process isn't pleasant, but we'll come back to this at the end. Now Shin Megami Tensei takes this dynamic even further, and widens its scope to include all sorts of supernatural entities and folklore legends from across the world. Hence, the use of the word demon has shifted. There's two main reasons for this. The first is to reference how in the ancient world, there was less of a distinction between gods and demons. Kazunari Suzuki, one of SMT1's writers, explained this in the Shin Megami Tensei TRPG, saying, The concept of a wrathful god eventually warped into that of a guardian deity, who protected his nations and peoples through the development of governance and culture. Though these gods evolved over time to have a more benevolent image, this quote-unquote mnemonic nature is still an aspect of their identity and is sometimes revealed in apocalyptic scripture. The other meaning behind the use of the word demon is to reflect on its etymological root, the Greek word daimon. In Greek mythology, daimon was used to refer to spirits generally. They were often the personifications of abstract concepts or natural objects. For example, Thanatos is death, Eros is love, and nymphs were the spirits of trees. This usage is fitting because in Shin Megami Tensei, Rather than having demons represent just stress and anxiety, here they are the full range of the human experience, religion and philosophy being expressions of how we perceive reality around us. In an interview from the Demon Bible, Kazuma Kaneko, the series' original demon designer, explained his view, saying, Scriptures and similar writings are like textbooks about people's way of living. They tell you what to do if you fail or what someone important said, yet at the same time, they also warn you that you will be punished if you do bad things. 
Perhaps they needed this in a time when there was no such thing as TV. For example, Buddhism too has a concept of death and rebirth. If you do not succeed in this life, you will in the next one, because they obviously did not have counseling in temples. What they had were folk remedies. This brings us to Carl Jung. Generally, Jungian psychology is just brought up in regard to persona, but it's still pretty important to the thematic basis of mainline SMT. Jung argued for the existence of a collective unconscious, which was shared between all humankind on a psychic level and did not need to be learned. Being metaphysical, it was made up of archetypes, which represent specific ideas. These manifest in the religious practices of a people, and as they become established tradition, they move further and further away from the source as they are perceived. This is because the conscious mind acts on them, rationalizing them. Jung believed that, as the collective unconscious was akin to the soul, that mythology should be viewed as humans projecting themselves into patterns they observed in nature. In his essay, Archetypes and the Collective Unconscious, he wrote, All the mythologized processes of nature, such as summer and winter, the phases of the moon, the rainy seasons, and so on, are in no sense allegories of these objective occurrences. Rather, they are the symbolic expressions of the inner, unconscious drama of the psyche, which becomes accessible to man's consciousness by way of projection, that is, mirrored in the events of nature. You can essentially picture demons in SMT as a literal take on Jung, with demons as physical manifestations of human thoughts. In fact, in SMT Strength's journey, they're depicted as data. Like Jung, the Atlas Staff used the interpretation of a worldwide meta-myth as the basis for all mythology that manifests differently in different areas. In the Nocturne Guide's fan Q&A, Kanako described this, saying, It's almost like a shared memory of the events that happened in ancient times has remained to make people draw up the same motifs. The easiest example of this is again found in Strange Journey with the Mothers, the Mother Goddess archetype. We have the Greek Ouroboros Maya, the Babylonian Tiamat, and the Hindu Maya, being specific versions of Mem Aleph, who is the abstract. In this lens, the Great Will functions as the collective unconscious. In the simplest terms possible, the Great Will is a collection of all the thoughts of mankind. So you can picture demons as being stored in the Great Will until they manifest. On top of that, the Great Will is identified with the Ein Sof, which is a concept from Jewish mysticism also known as Kabbalah, that refers to God in its purest form as infinite, thus indescribable. While this form is hidden from perception, aspects of God are revealed to the Spherot, the Tree of Life. And the further you went up towards Kether, the crown, the closer you were to God in its fullness. So here, SMT is reframing spiritual growth in perceiving aspects of God to societal change, in perceiving different aspects of these ideas as demons. Similarly, as shown with Mem Aleph, demons who represent prominent symbols can birth their own subsequent symbols. This concept of the Great Will is referenced as far back as Megami Tensei II. When is defeated, he says, I am but one part of an incorporeal entity which controls countless universes. There are much stronger aggregations of consciousness than this universe. It's important to note here that the staff don't totally agree with Young. Their take is a lot more grounded. The staff understand these shared symbols as being due to cultural relations between early human societies, and as such, recognize their fluid nature. They are not objective fact in abstract. This is important because at their core, demons represent social structures that we have created. Now that doesn't mean what they describe is any less real, just that they've been crafted to suit its audience. These ideas are malleable and both literally and metaphorically alive. Likewise, the way these ideas function between cultures may differ. And even further, the symbols we use can not only evolve naturally, but be manipulated. This is shown in SMT1 when the demon Echidna tells the player, Long ago, there were many deities like me. The god of law was able to drop us all into the underworld. Thus, the glorious days where the gods of ancient times lived together with mankind came to an end. This being an allusion to the real life demonization of gods and rival religions by Abrahamic faiths. In their monotheistic framework, by definition, other gods could not exist, at least not on the same level as THE God. When met with other beliefs, they justified their own by claiming other gods were not divine. They were empty and devoid, or even worse, a trick from Satan. This goes back to what Kazunari Suzuki was saying earlier, is that often, what separates a god from a demon is how they're perceived. This theme was first made explicit in Shin Megami Tensei for Apocalypse, through the concept of observation. 
but as shown, this was always implicit throughout the Shin Megami Tensei series. This use of demons ties into the series setting of Tokyo. While it was in part inspired by media like the aforementioned Devil Man, it would be grossly oversimplifying it to stop the conversation there. Initially, the use of demons in Megami Tensei was largely due to the fact that they were adapting the novel. This changed in part due to the staff's transition to the Super Famicom. Space in cartridges for the original Famicom was real tight and didn't have the capacity to hold over 200 demons. This shift to the new console gave the staff impetus to do more research, and this naturally evolved their view of the work. In an interview with Famitsu, Koji Okada explained the connection, saying, Tokyo is that way, so is Japan itself, but in a sense, it can accept just about anything. For example, religion. There was an era of national isolationism, sure, but in the end, Buddhism, Shintoism, Christianity, and many other religions are all mixed in here. It used to be that temples and shrines were treated the same. There is also the viewpoint that Shinto isn't even a religion in the first place, and if one investigated, it would become a matter of what is the origin of the Japanese people. I thought I wanted to show these kinds of ideas in Megami Tensei. Through the outbreak of demons, a religion that came from India changed and spread its roots in Japan. It's meant to betray something like that. This theme of change, especially in a Japanese context, is central to SMT's use of Tokyo. In a lecture at the University of Tokyo, Koji Okada argued that it's one of the few cities in the world that undergoes a cycle of destruction and rebirth. He thought that, even though Tokyo was familiar, its presence as a setting is comparable to medieval Europe or fantasy worlds. Later in that interview with Famitsu, he would give a more in-depth explanation. At the heart of my worldview, there is somewhat of a religious belief, but there's also the fact that us two were born and raised in Tokyo, and we wanted to represent the Tokyo of that time in the game. In all the world, there's no city as abundant in change. In the space of 100 years, there was the Meiji Restoration, the Great Kanto Earthquake of 1923, the Great Tokyo Air Raid. It was essentially rebuilt from the ground up, and only then it became this capital city. I've gone overseas for work many times, but I've never seen this amalgamation of politics and entertainment the way Tokyo does it. Our culture is also like that, you know? This makes a lot of sense. Like many major cities, Tokyo has had a very turbulent history teetering from extreme to extreme, both socially and economically. For example, the Great Tokyo Air Raid that Okada mentioned refers to a series of firebombing performed by the US during World War II, specifically Operation Meeting House. From March 9th to the 10th, the US purposefully targeted urban areas to disturb Japanese factory production. This meant severe civilian casualties. To compare, the fatalities of the nuclear bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki together total 110,000, while Meeting House is generally believed to have 100,000 by itself, with some historians arguing the number multiple times higher. It left over a million people homeless and was so serious that right after the war, Tokyo was receiving over a fourth of the country's total reconstruction budget. Similarly, all of the events Okada named were major events in modern Japanese history, but may not be so familiar to a Western audience. So I'm going to give a basic rundown of Japanese history, starting with the Imperial Line. Japan's current emperor is descended from the Yamato, which were a clan of high priests that gained supremacy over the region by the 8th century. However, their authority quickly faded in the face of a series of military leaders called daimyos that ruled over small domains. This meant that there were very regular power struggles across the region until 1555, when Oda Nobunaga began his military campaigns to unify the country. By 1591, his successor, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, would have control over the whole of Japan. His rule is notable in particular because it was when Christianity was initially banned in Japan, as it was feared that the populace believing in foreign religions could cause their support to the government to waver. This policy would later be expanded into one of mere total seclusion by rule of the Tokugawa shogunate who took charge of the country after Hideyoshi's death. At that point, the only countries Japan would trade with were China, Korea, and the Netherlands through the Dutch East India Company. Now the Tokugawa shogunate is known for being one of the most stable periods of Japanese history, largely due to their strict social control. 
any opposing daimyo were effectively neutralized through having them and their families forced to periodically live in the capital for years, holding them hostage while helping to dissolve any emotional ties they might have to their territory. Likewise, many samurai were relieved of military duty and given stipends. A number of them would become policemen. Finally, commoners were forced to register at local Buddhist temples. Subsequently, they weren't allowed to move or even travel without the government's permission, with temples being ordered to confirm the locals' religious beliefs. So this policy doubly worked to tighten the ban on Christianity. This blockade of Western culture and goods worked relatively well until 1839, when it became exceedingly clear that Japan's policy of isolation was quickly becoming untenable. China, attempting to stop a massive wave of drug abuse, along with the increasingly uncomfortable amounts of foreign influence in its borders, halted all sales of opium. For those who don't know, opium is the plant used to make the drugs codeine and morphine. However, England saw opium as a lucrative market, so in response, they declared war. Within five years, China was totally defeated and was forced to sign the first of the unequal treaties. These were a series of quote-unquote agreements that allowed foreign powers to effectively colonize China. This led the European powers, along with the US and eventually Japan, vying for control over parts of China, all while ignoring the actual Chinese government. So the message was clear. If you weren't willing to open your borders, the Western powers were going to open them for you. Around this time, the United States was going through its own growing pains. Though speaking honestly, that pain was felt by everyone but them because what they were developing into was an imperial power. They were fresh off the Mexican-American War, having newly gained what would later become the states California, Nevada, and Utah, among others, and were now looking to flex its strength on Japan. In 1853, Japan would have to face its fears when US Commodore Matthew Perry arrived on their shores. He had a simple imperative, trade privileges or war. This is what we call gunboat diplomacy, at the time, the US Navy was so feared among the Japanese populace that the Kurofune, or the black ships, would become a symbol of a major cultural shift and of US imperialism. Under threat of violence, Japan was forced to acquiesce and sign the Treaty of Kanagawa, which opened two trade ports to US sailors, Shimoda and Hakodate. However, this in turn gave Western powers more confidence in exerting their influence over Japan. Shortly after, through the Anse Treaties, Japan opened these same ports to four more nations, Britain, France, the Netherlands, and Russia. Then following Perry, US Consul General Townsend Harris pushed for an even harsher treaty, still backed by naval threats, leading to the Harris Treaty, which ironically contained conditions eerily similar to those in the unequal treaties. This would cause massive changes in Japanese society. Inflation rates ballooned as Westerners realized that they could abuse local exchange rates by buying tons of gold in Japan, then selling it in China for three times the price. Likewise, the low import taxes forced on the nation pushed many Japanese people out of business because they couldn't compete with cheap, high-quality foreign products. This bred severe civil unrest and even riots, and directly led to a new direction of Japan as a nation. In his book, A Modern History of Japan, from Tokugawa times to the present, Andrew Gordon wrote, It would be misleading to conclude simply that these treaties trampled a pre-existing national pride and sovereignty. Rather, from the early 1800s through the 1860s, the very process of dealing with the pushy barbarians created modern Japanese nationalism. Among shogunal officials, in daimyo castles, and in the private academies where politically concerned samurai debated history and policy, a new conception took hold of Japan as a single nation to be defended and governed as such. As this happened, the Tokugawa claim to be Japan's legitimate defender began to wither. The daimyo, sensing weakness in the state, saw a chance to topple the shogunate. For the first time in over 200 years, peasants would be allowed to carry weapons and join the offensive against the Tokugawa. By 1867, armies formed by an alliance between the Satsuma and Choshu daimyos were marching into Kyoto. They ejected the shogun and reinstated the authority of the emperor, Meiji, at the age of 15. This is formally known as the Meiji Restoration. While the rebels did use the emperor as a tool to claim legitimacy, 
This event is still notable for being the first time in centuries that the emperor had real political power. By 1889, they had ratified the Meiji Constitution, which codified their new political system with a prime minister and a cabinet. This made Japan the first non-European constitutional monarchy. This, of course, came with massive social and economic reform. All of the daimyo were essentially forced into retirement, and their territory returned to the emperor. They converted over 250 semi-autonomous domains into 72 prefectures, with some of the old daimyos serving as governors. They established the Central Bank of Japan, and with it the yen, as central currency. This followed a revision of their tax system. Previously, entire villages were taxed in bulk, with each household pitching in. Now, national surveys were held to match measures of land with certain people who were then given deeds of ownership. This changed the relationship regular citizens had with both the state and the land they lived on. On the opposite end of the spectrum, the government also effectively ended the samurai as a social class. This was a very surprising change since it seemed like a betrayal of the samurai that aided the revolution. But the stipends they were receiving had been eating up nearly half of the annual national budget. This change gave the government the freedom to build a new national railroad along with a compulsory educational system. They got these ideas from traveling the world to see how all the Western powers functioned so they could apply it to their own country. It put the Japanese government in a weird place where, while they held active disdain towards the Western powers, they were clearly emulating them, not just for economic success, but political legitimacy. The biggest thing they had learned was that a strong military is only possible with a strong economic base. This success, in turn, led to a sense of superiority. Japan felt that they should represent the head of a pan-Asian alliance to defend against Western influence. They believed that this gave them the authority to take what they wanted from neighboring countries by force, which would eventually lead Japan into becoming another imperialist power. Another event in Japanese history that Koji Okada named is the Great Kanto Earthquake. During World War I, Japan saw huge success because European countries weren't able to maintain their economic ties with their Asian consumers, leaving the market wide open. However, shortly after, in 1920, Japan was facing the global post-war depression, and their stock market crashed. While they were able to recover to some degree in the years following, in 1923, the earthquake hit. In its wake, up to 200,000 people went missing or died, with three-fourths of the homes in the region left in ruins. This forced the government to kick into overdrive, because, besides the damages, this had effectively flatlined the economic activity in the country's biggest city. In an attempt to recuperate, they encouraged banks to be liberal with their loans, which in turn caused another crisis in 1927. Rumors swirled, questioning if the banks could actually back those loans, while behind the scenes, the banks didn't have diverse portfolios, and the government wasn't guaranteeing them. Then suddenly, the Bank of Taiwan collapsed. This was an issue because it was actually a Japanese-owned colonial venture. When it fell, it took the Suzuki Trading Company with it, and tons of people took this as the rumor becoming reality. The rush to the banks this caused led to the collapse of even more domestic banks. And what's worse, the effects of the earthquake weren't just economic. Tension reached its height as even more rumors spread that in the midst of the panic, immigrants and socialists would take this chance to spark a revolution. This led to the media and even the government urging citizens to take arms with the military to quote-unquote defend the nation. Almost 3,000 lynch mobs rose up across the city, hunting down anyone that they assumed were Korean or Chinese. The death toll was in the thousands, with hundreds of murders committed by government officials, specifically military or police. This influence can be seen through Violence Jack. The manga is set in the year 1970X, when Tokyo was hit by the Great Kanto Hellquake, it destroyed the city's infrastructure and chaos ensued, leaving it a wasteland filled with millions of corpses. Shortly after, the areas along the fault line sank into the ocean, so leaving the area was impossible from the inside. And from the outside, there was no hope, because after three months, the Japanese government totally abandoned the region, regarding it a no-man's land. As such, Kanto quickly fell into survival of the fittest. 
The manga focuses on conflicts surrounding the Slum King, a bloodthirsty tyrant trying to take control over all of Kanto by force. There are a series of people fighting against him who are often represented by a man named Violence Jack, a giant beast of a man who gives the remnants of a civilized Tokyo the willpower to keep fighting. An obvious parallel between Shin Megami Tensei and Violence Jack is the setting of an apocalyptic Tokyo with a desert-like appearance. But the parallels don't stop there. At the end of the manga, it's revealed that Violence Jack is actually a sequel to Devilman. After its final battle, God purified the earth, resetting it. When Satan saw this, they attempted to create life on their own, recreating the Tokyo they once knew. However, memories of Tokyo's destruction reflected on the new one, leading to the Hellquake. Satan's grief over the events of Devilman splintered their psyche, manifesting as several different characters, including the Slum King. When they eventually realize their true form, they revive as the Great Demon God and set off to return the world to nothing. Meanwhile, Violence Jack is revealed to be the reincarnation of Devilman, who goes off once more to fight Satan in hopes of stopping them from destroying humanity. The story resumes far into the future, and humanity has managed to rebuild Tokyo. Without Slum King, the warring humans realized they had no reason to fight and work together for a brighter future. Here, not only do we see more of Gona Gai's use of Jungian themes, but we're more explicitly introduced to another one of Shin Megami Tensei's most important themes, the cycle. Both Devilman and Violence Jack revolve around cycles of violence, represented literally through biblical imagery. God smites demons, then demons murder humans. SMT reframes this dynamic through Koji Okada's previous statements, tying this concept to the city of Tokyo itself. We can also relate this to the title of the series, Shin Megami Tensei translates to True Goddess Metempsychosis, with Metempsychosis essentially being the Greek version of reincarnation. While in the original novels, this referred to the literal reincarnation of the Shinto goddess Izanami. In SMT, it can be interpreted that the quote-unquote goddess is actually Tokyo. This was made explicit as a story element in SMT4, but I would argue it was alluded to in the credits for SMT2 when a shining feminine figure flies onto the black screen. It's also worth noting that Okada is from Tokyo's Asasuka district, which is known in part for the Sensoji. This is a Buddhist temple built in 645 CE, making it the oldest Buddhist temple in Japan. However, during World War II, it was destroyed in Operation Meeting House, then later rebuilt. Afterwards, it became a symbol of both rebirth and the very city of post-war Tokyo. This forms a core facet of SMT's view of the cycle, based on the Hindu theme of creation through destruction. This is then related to apocalyptic literature, like the biblical book of Revelation, where evil deities and or demons fight against the good deities, laying waste to society in the process. In that lens, this too is a rebirth in its own way, turning the scriptures into a window of the human condition. It even goes back to what Kazunari Suzuki was alluding to in the SMT TTRPG where the apocalypse reveals the true faces of these figures. Through this context, Shin Megami Tensei depicted the cycle through the alignment system, specifically the battle between law and chaos. This is one facet of the series often glazed over when discussed, but the alignments are meant to be explicit references to real-life politics, not just religion. These two elements work as extreme opposites, juxtaposed against each other that human society swings back and forth from. In Strange Journey Reminiscence, this is explained clearly through the Will of the Earth, SJ's version of the Great Will. In terms of information, the Will of the Earth has crystallized various kinds of information inside. Basically, it possesses thoughts and images. It has both images that align with the Chaos Faction and ones that align with Law. At the core of the Chaos Alignment, there was Mem Aleph, whereas one of the plentiful powers of Law was the Three Wise Men, as you may know. These all normally maintain equilibrium, which is known as the force that makes the will of the Earth evolve. But if for some reason that balance were to crumble, these individual images would flow, and they'd become forces that act on their own. In the context of SJ, this disturbed balance is caused by the destruction of the Earth through global warming. As you may know, the vast majority of the effects of global warming are perpetuated by corporations, which are enabled by the countries they're active in. This gave the populace revolutionary ideals, represented by chaos, and led to the manifestation of Mem Aleph, 
the Schwartz well itself in part functions as a means to change the world. This can also be shown in SMT2's final boss dialogue, which tells you that he will always be brought back by the will of the universe. This isn't just sequel bait, it's alluding to the fact that he represents an authoritarian form of law. While you can defeat him, it won't last. Mankind will naturally yearn for such an ideal eventually, meaning he will naturally appear again as his prominence as an idea resurges. The cycle is a prominent theme across nearly every mainline game including Nocturne through The Reasons and SMT5 through The Throne. It's often depicted as being the Samsara, the Buddhist cycle of reincarnation. To explain in short, Buddhists believe that existence is defined by suffering. Your life around you and you as an individual are illusions that facilitate this suffering. As long as you remain unenlightened, you are doomed to be repeatedly reborn in a series of different worlds and forms based on your karma, the weight of your actions. While on one hand, this is used literally since there are characters who actually reincarnate like the heroine from SMT1, this also functions as a major metaphor. In Shin Megami Tensei, demons are the personification of karma. When discussing Strange Journey, Shogo Isogai, the game's writer said, I thought of demons as a liability in human intellectual activities. When humans do something wrong, they accumulate regret and repentance. This accumulation must eventually be paid off as in, it is a system that brings temperance to human beings. This is important to note because demons need to be understood as a natural response to human actions. They aren't just mindless monsters, they're a symbol of our social structures. And because humans are social animals, they are necessarily linked to humanity. We can see this elaborated on in messages attributed to the character Steven in the Nocturne licensed La Vie J laptop. He says, if you take a look at reincarnation as a concept and think about it, at the same time that an individual person participates in constructing the world, they have the ability to change the world itself. This is mostly my subjective opinion, but since I have to explain this, it's like this. Humans, through will and their deeds, karma, reincarnate to become something other than human, but in of itself, that is not something humanity can control. They can't overcome this reincarnation as what stimulates this is not humans, but the world. But the world too, through this process of making humans reincarnate, for the first time, it can go from nothing to being. In short, the world exists to reincarnate humans, and through this process, the world takes shape. This theme of reincarnation is even more central to SMT1 as a game. Initially, it was planned to be Megami Tensei 3, but eventually, it would be proposed as a rebirth, or in more colloquial terms, a reboot of the original Megami Tensei games. In the drafts, staff wrote, We grabbed the strongest points of Megami Tensei 1 and 2, and turned many ideas we couldn't use on the Famicom into reality through the Super Famicom. This is a true Megami Tensei. This being a play on the name Shin Megami Tensei, since the kanji Shin can mean true or new. One of the biggest departures from the original Megami Tensei games was the addition of Law and Chaos. Of course, Megami Tensei 2 did have an alignment system, but it was based around good versus evil. The issue with this is that these terms are very loaded. What even is good and evil? In a Christian sense, we can say for example, sin is evil because it goes against the word of God, who is good. However, without an objective basis for reality, the debate becomes subjective. My view of good is not yours, and your view of evil is not mine. Even more so in Shin Megami Tensei, where this dilemma becomes material reality. Again, demons are ideas. This pushes the responsibility of the choice onto the player. We can see this in the draft documents for SMT1. Originally, law was called good, and chaos was called evil. And as they explain, in this case, good and evil are not absolutes that can be understood from the perspective of a specific deity. Perhaps it would be better to think of different names to represent the alignments. Shin Megami Tensei is not a story about good and evil. In the game, the player sees many scenarios that struggle with this question. Are you okay with murdering demons? What I'm saying is, only the player's actions are just. So the purpose of the alignment structure is to make the player consider and question the reality around them. If you had the authority, how would you run society? 
Ironically, the shift towards law and chaos actually helps the staff explore the moral grays of good and evil. As Koji Okada says, is law always right and is chaos always wrong? I think this was a very good decision in hindsight considering how the Western fanbase is very keen on trying to find a quote unquote correct route or even canon ending when that's clearly against the stated point. This goes back to what I said earlier about how the staff and therefore the games were heavily influenced by contemporary Japanese society. The original Shin Megami Tensei features numerous references to real life places or culture from the time. For instance, the game starts in Kichijoji because that's where Kanako was living. He viewed it as being full of weirdos and delinquents, with Kanako himself admittingly having been one in his school days. Likewise, the Dungeon Echo building was based off a real place. It was a game center that was seemingly abandoned even though it was located in a prosperous housing area, giving it an eerie atmosphere. Furthermore, the game features references to the Yakuza and Bodycon, which was a style of form-fitting dress often worn by women in dance clubs. In the book Shin Megami Tensei Grimoire Chaos Museum, it's said that a discotheque, the Juliana Tokyo, embodied the spirit of the 90s in Japan. It featured raised stands where women dressed in Bodycon would dance to Eurobeat. And of course, in both SMT1 and 2, the discos are information hubs, where you find world building and how to progress the story. I think this is even more interesting because in the manga Devilman, the club was a symbol of pure hedonism, which made it a prime location to summon demons. However, if we're talking about the alignments, we have to look more deeply at the historical context of Japan and its politics. Since Shin Megami Tensei 1 released in 1992, what this immediately calls to mind is the lost decade of Japan. So in the 80s, Japan had one of the world's most successful economies. From 88 to 89, Japan's gross government debt to GDP dropped by 3% from 70% to 67. But as the 90s came in, things turned for the worst when the bubble burst. In 1990, the stock market crashed. Then shortly after in 91, the real estate market did as well. By 1995, the gross debt to GDP skyrocketed to around 90%. In the following years, the Nikkei index lost approximately half its value and land prices fell by more than 30%. During this period, there were even more losses than there were during Black Thursday, the stock market crash that sparked the Great Depression. This created an atmosphere of deep despair and a choking anxiety towards the future. Now, when we look at Shin Megami Tensei 1, the conflict in the early game is chiefly concerning American imperialism versus Japanese fascism. A colonel in the Japanese military named Goto plans on summoning a mass of demons to Earth in order to restore the old gods. In response, the United States plans to launch nuclear ICBMs at Tokyo, totally eradicating the city to halt the spread of demons. However, soon after, Goto learns of this conspiracy, uses his demons to erect a barrier over Tokyo, then performs a military coup to take over the local government. This way, he can enact martial law, creating a struggle against the American troops stationed in the city. To stop the fighting, a resistance group forms in Shinjuku and is joined by the main character. However, they are unable to stop the ICBMs from launching. This is known as the Great Cataclysm. 30 years later, and Tokyo is a wasteland. The bombs, along with the subsequent invasion of demons, left Tokyo a shell of itself. These extreme conditions have forced the survivors to look towards extreme solutions, namely the Chaos-aligned Cult of Gaia and the Law-aligned Order of Messiah. But what are these groups really? For the Cult of Gaia, they're a group with a heavy Buddhist aesthetic. However, as Chaos, they represent the diversity of nature along with the plurality of worldwide cultures and polytheism, meaning it features a bevy of different opinions. However, as a group, they only value strength. They're willing to do anything in their power to get ahead because they believe that if there's such a thing as justice, it must be backed by power to enforce it. In turn, this power justifies itself. Furthermore, they see political discourse as an ongoing conflict between ideas where only the strongest survive. Due to this, a regime change in a chaos government would not be viewed as faulty leadership, but instead, as their society working as intended. They see it as natural, as policies exist to be changed. If something fails, that reflects on the quality of that idea. And it was time for a better idea anyway. To a guy in, this is true freedom, because rather than needing to check some specific box, theoretically anything or anyone can succeed. Lucifer is worshiped not only for his strength, but as a Promethean figure symbolizing free will due to his conflict with the God of Law. This likely has to do with the fact that many members of Chaos are noted to be antisocial, in that they do not work well in groups 
and dislike being restricted by others. This is Atlas's description of chaos, by the way. This can be seen in not just the chaos hero, but Ozawa and even the biker gang enemy encounters. Its leaders all act fairly autonomously, but are loosely connected by the distaste of law. See Echidna, Yama, etc. Asura O's presence as a leader of the assault on the cathedral rather than Lucifer is also meant to reflect a broad view of chaos that has banded together. The most obvious real-life analog to the cult of Gaia is the infamous Am Shinrikyo. Though note that while they are widely known for domestic terrorism, the chemical attack they committed occurred in 1995, three years after the release of Shin Megami Tensei 1. Anyway, Am Shinrikyo was founded in 1987 by Shoko Asahara as a Buddhist cult and over time would absorb aspects from many other religions. For example, by 1991, Asahara was claiming to be a manifestation of Shiva, a major Hindu deity who presides over the destruction part of the cycle. However, this was argued to actually be an affirmation of their Buddhist nature. The rationale was that the historical Buddha would have had a Hindu upbringing, and therefore Shiva would have been an inspirational deity for him. The cult's beliefs centered around the idea that the world and its culture was far too materialistic, and that simply existing in them could attract someone to sin. Needing to escape society, members of the cult would seclude themselves in religious communes. To them, the outside represented the Buddhist lower realms, the state of existence under human including hell, that one would be subjected to for having poor karma. Similar to Goto, Asahara claimed to see a vision of the apocalyptic future via nuclear holocaust, caused by armed conflict between Japan and foreign powers led by the US. However, he petitioned the public by saying if he had two branches in each country around the world, he could stop this tragedy by absorbing the world's bad karma. This was meshed with a dualistic cosmic struggle between good and evil, as he argued that he was being blocked by a collaboration between forces of the Japanese government, Freemasons, and the Jewish people. He even explicitly used Christian imagery comparing the United States to the Beast of Revelations. I think this is interesting considering the law side of SMT is based on both the United States and these same conspiracies. And in Shin Megami Tensei 2, law is a representation of Satan, the Dragon of Revelation. It's worth noting that likewise in Nocturne, the cult of Gaia is mentioned as being a suspected terrorist cult. That said, the cult of Gaia themselves are chiefly motivated by a desire to resist law. As said earlier, prior to the plot of SMT1, the god of law had demonized the other gods and locked them away into the Makai. With the ancient gods returned, Earth would return to a pre-modern society with humans and demons coexisting. As I'm sure you can tell, the chaos alignment in SMT was heavily influenced by the demons from Devilman in that they represent the form of idealized past which is in part defined by might makes right. Their very name contains a reference to the Greek personification of Earth, Gaia, which calls back to the idealization of nature and her perceived status as a mother goddess, which Atlas understood to be one of the earliest forms of religion. However, chaos goes further to tie their ideas of social Darwinism together with the cycle. We can see this in Lucifer's dialogue during SMT1's chaos ending. This world is shaped by chaos. With each passing generation, we will grow ever stronger and ever more beautiful. May the cycle of destruction continue without ceasing. While this may sound nice on the surface, what he's actually talking about is how he views discrimination against the weak as being part of a natural cycle. Through this process, the weak are regularly weeded out meaning that technically the society becomes progressively stronger because the weak have died. This is very important to keep in mind when discussing Chaos's view of freedom. They understand it to be when there are no overarching rules so anyone can theoretically say or do whatever they want. But effective social freedom presupposes equality. In settings with strict hierarchies, authority figures will abuse their power to consolidate their position. Don't be mistaken, while Chaos has issues with Law's form of rule, they aren't arguing against hierarchy as a concept. Their view of the strong versus the weak is blatantly a hierarchy. Lucifer himself, who was considered to be the leader of Chaos, is titled Demon King, and in Shin Megami Tensei 2, literally lives in a castle. Then nearly 30 years later, Shin Megami Tensei 5 has Chaos's social Darwinism manifest as anarcho-capitalism, which is a political system that believes in giving a government as little power as possible in favor of corporations. In Kabukicho, Black Frost openly talks about desiring a free market where the rich control prices so he could take over the economy and become emperor. You'd be hard pressed to find a political system more hierarchical than these. 
This can be seen in Shin Megami Tensei 2 with the character Ozawa. He starts off as a bully and sticks around Goto for one purpose, to obtain power. Ozawa is a man with no morals and he will openly tell the player he doesn't really care about Goto's goals. After the Great Cataclysm, he is able to seize power in Shinjuku due to the power vacuum by allying himself with the demon Take Minakata. While this made Shinjuku's citizens safe from demons, they weren't safe from Ozawa. He converted his old gang, Turtlehead, into his private police force and gave them free reign over the district. His police officers are deeply corrupt and regularly steal from the locals. If you pay attention, you can see that most of the Shinjuku citizens are in rags, unlike the policemen, and Ozawa himself who wears a suit. To make matters worse, while Ozawa is grossly abusing their authority, some citizens have settled into his rule because, at the very least, with him present, they don't run the risk of being murdered by demons. That said, they aren't really given much of a choice. Anyone who shows public disapproval for Ozawa is brainwashed, while anyone who tries to escape Shinjuku is murdered. This brings us to the most explicit nationalistic aspects of chaos. In my opinion, the most striking chaos character in Shin Megami Tensei 1 is not Lucifer, it's Goto. Goto is based on a real life person named Hiraoka Kimitake. He was born into an elite family with a grandfather who had worked in the Ministry of Home Affairs and his father in the Ministry of Agriculture and Commerce. While Kimitake had an easy route to becoming a bureaucrat, he left in favor to pursue a writing career where he would become one of the most famed writers in Japanese history under the pen name which many of you may know, Mishima Yukio. However, his literary career's legacy is clouded by his political history. While Mishima was a highly respected author by his 30s, he didn't write anything explicitly political until 1960. That year, one of the biggest protests in modern Japanese history occurred surrounding the ratification of a revision to the security treaty that the US had forced upon Japan as a condition for ending the post-war occupation. These are called the Anpo protests. During this period, Mishima found even ground with left-wing activists in rejecting American imperialism. The right-wing in Japan was still very sore over the capitulations that they had been forced to make. The United States not only had been largely responsible for writing their constitution, they had reduced the emperor from a god to a man, when the emperor's authority was the basis of the Japanese government. Furthermore, Article 9 of the new Japanese constitution had the country renounce the right to warfare, saying, Land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. The right of belligerency of the state will not be recognized. While they did eventually form the Japanese self-defense forces as a defensive army, it stung because it was barely, if at all, legal, and arguably only existed to be a tool for the United States in the Cold War against the Soviet Union. In response, Mishima opted to create a small militia called the Tate no Kai, or Shield Society, based on his own ultra-nationalist politics. Then, on November 25th, 1970, Mishima and four members of his own militia marched on the headquarters of the JSDF and held the commander hostage while giving a speech to the citizens from a balcony. He argued that Japan had sold its soul to the Western powers for economic gain while the citizens lost their collective Japanese identity. He believed that their lack of real military was the source of this corruption because he viewed the military as a core of the national identity. To this end, he urged JSDF to revolt because their country was in jeopardy. However, his speech was met with great disapproval. Having failed in his goal, he decided to commit seppuku, a form of ritualistic suicide performed by samurai to preserve their honor. We can view Goto as Shin Megami Tensei's version of Mishima, who succeeded in starting a coup. Goto can even be found in Ichigaya, where the JSDF headquarters were in real life. Even more parallels can be seen between Goto and Mishima when looking at the visionary items in the GBA port of Shin Megami Tensei 1. The 13th item, SDF unit pin, shows a cutscene where Goto wrests control of the military from the chief of staff. It features passing references not only to the mutual cooperation treaty, the revised version of the aforementioned security treaty, but how Goto would be breaching the JSDF's jurisdiction. This is interesting because in Mishima's manifesto, he talks about how it's the police's job to protect the government, while it's the military's job to protect the nation. However, he believed that the Japanese government was becoming complacent through using the police to successfully quell several left-wing protests. 
This meant that the politicians could comfortably carry on without any significant change from the outside. When Mishima saw that the police had blatantly become a weapon of the corrupt state, his answer was to revolt to go even further right wing. He believed that it was the military's job to step in where the police had failed to protect the legitimacy of the government. After the coup, the military was supposed to awaken the true Japan. Through re-establishment of traditional Japanese values, especially that of the veneration of the divine emperor. This espousal of the Japanese identity continued in the 14th item, Megaphone where Goto gives a speech to his followers after the coup. Here he plainly states ideals identical to Mishima, saying, Western culture is ruining us. We've lost our Japanese spirit and culture. What will be left for future generations? We must show Western culture an iron fist. Let us build a true culture where Japan and the people of the world coexist. Our enemies are the Western gods who want us humans to blindly work for them. It must be said that the period that Mishima, therefore Goto, is calling back to is the height of Imperial Japan, where their vision of Pan-Asian unity directly led to Japanese colonization of Korea, Taiwan, and a military presence in China. While Goto does seem to be related to the cult of Gaia, rather than having a Buddhist aesthetic, his is based more around Shintoism. This certainly makes sense considering Mishima himself was Shintoist. But this is important because this actually reframes his dialogue about the restoration of the old gods to be him talking about the sovereignty of the emperor. In fact, the banner behind Goto in Camp Ichigaya appears to have the kanji for the name Amaterasu Omikami, the chief god in Shintoism, which literally translates to the great August Kami who shines in the heaven. In the Nihon Shoki and the Kojiki, the oldest historical records in Japan, the imperial line is said to be directly descended from Amaterasu. The emperor's authority is tied to this, and Amaterasu, in turn, is the symbol of imperialist Japan, the rising sun. Likewise, this brings new meaning to the ICBMs dropped by Thorman. In World War II, the nuclear bombs were weapons that forced the Japanese to surrender unconditionally, and of course the emperor to denounce their status as deity. In this light, the bombs dropped by law represent weapons that could even kill gods. This relation to Imperial Japan is not relegated to just Goto either. His followers appear as an enemy encounter called Suicide Units, a reference to the Japanese values that demand gleeful death for country which was the ideology that informed World War II's kamikaze units. Further, in Shimagami Tensei Encyclopedia, the master of the heretical mansion, who we now know as Mido, was given the alignment Neutral Chaos, the same as the human Gaians. Prior to that, the Shimagami Tensei fanbook Jakio no Yakata, there was a developer Q&A where they mentioned him saying, there is one member of the mansion who used to be part of the upper echelon of the Imperial Japanese army. After the war, he was executed as a war criminal, but was revived using a heretical formula. Likewise, Yama, the Vedic judge of the dead, runs his court in Ikibukuro's Sugumo prison. This was a prison initially used by Japanese forces to imprison political prisoners. And during World War II, it held POWs. Then, post-war, the Allied powers used it to house Japanese war criminals. In 1971, the prison was demolished and in its place, the Sunshine 60 was built, which is the tallest skyscraper in Japan. So the use of this prison was purposeful considering it's not around now. That said, while you're there, Stephen tells you the judgment itself is indeed fair, but it is based around the ethical standards of chaos. So if you don't hold the same values, you could be in real trouble. The Shimigami Tensei Grimoire Chaos Museum explains this further, saying, This logic is reminiscent of a parody of military trials. I wonder if the people detained in Sugumo prison were also subjected to such one-sided trials. And in context, they're pretty clearly talking about the trials of Japanese war criminals. This comment raises quite a few questions, the most obvious of which we are not going to cover at the moment because it's outside of the scope of this video. Though I will say, ew, gross, disgusting even. But it is curious that they would have Yama represent the war trials when he represents the side of American imperialism. Personally, I think it's because Sugumo kind of personifies the chaotic ideal of the cycle having been repurposed so many times. Maybe by reclaiming it for chaos, they are enacting a sort of righteous revenge. On top of this, Real life Japanese intellectuals used social Darwinism as a lens through which to link their religion to their politics. For one, scholar Kato Genchi understood that the international struggle was one of 
survival of the fittest. And further, that the development of society is tied to that of their religion. Therefore, he argued in favor of state Shinto as a form of cultural cohesion to bind the people closer together as a nation. Genshi's state Shinto had a focus on the worship of the emperor, who is viewed as a living example of the union between man and the divine, which was perfected in the Buddha. Genshi believed that this union is what defined religion, and would see his beliefs realized in the suicide of Nogi Marasuke. This was a beloved Japanese military officer who had a deep respect for the emperor, hence he committed seppuku with his wife on the day of Emperor Meiji's funeral. Genshi projected his view onto Marasuke's suicide, seeing it as an ultimate self-sacrifice that made him another example of a divine man comparing it to the enlightenment of Buddha. He believed that the whole country should be prepared to commit such an act on this basis. This way Genshi's views made religion and nationalism inseparable, literally deifying love for a country. What's interesting is that Genshi viewed the then existing religions as being unsatisfactory to describe his personal spiritual beliefs and attempted to mesh them, even discussing his ideal in Christian terms such as logos and referencing Jesus' crucifixion in regards to Nogi Marusuke's suicide. This mixture of religions combined with the nationalist ideal is sort of realized in the cult of Gaia. Juxtaposed with the cult of Gaia are the order of Messiah. Unlike chaos, the order is based around community. Here, the needy are readily welcomed and supported. In the city of Tokyo, the order of Messiah represents some of the only structure after the great cataclysm. With society collapsed, the order had an easy time building power precisely because of this. Law has a specific ideal, one banner that they are all supposed to band together. That means that unlike chaos, if a law leader dies, society can continue as planned because everyone is on the same page. This is equated with monotheism, with their law literally represented by God. The only thing messiahs value is devotion to and reliance on God. While this is generally a matter of personal faith, the games occasionally frame this as being sort of brainwashing, sort of self-brainwashing, though the order certainly does not shy away from literally brainwashing people as well. Because of this, the messiahs view any difficulties in life as a trial by God. Likewise, they can justify anything that happens as being planned by God, and to them is therefore good. This is based on the Christian view of human thought being subjective, with God as objective absolute good. In this lens, the morality of any act is based on its relation to God. This is the basis of the divine command theory, which argues that if God is goodness, then anything God commands must also be good, no matter the context. In Shin Megami Tensei, this devotion is meant to represent the repression of free will. This ties into the metaphorical aspects of the Order of Messiah's goal of eradicating demons. Since demons are ideas, the ratio of the ones that oppose God represents an attempt to create a world with a single paradigm where you're only allowed to think in certain ways. Since demons are emotions, messiahs are revealed to have left people numb, pacified by a dystopian authoritarian government. This is what would be realized in the Thousand Year Kingdom, a Christian concept taken from the Book of Revelation that describes a paradise where the faithful martyrs will be brought back to life to reign with Christ until Satan is freed from the pit. To law, it represents a society of perpetual peace with all of humanity united under God. Unlike chaos, their beliefs emphasize the importance of the collective rather than the individual. However, they're so extreme that they effectively believe specific persons are expendable. Messiahs are more than willing to martyr themselves for the cause with the promise of heaven awaiting them. Likewise, they're perfectly fine with murdering their ideological opposition. For them, this isn't a moral issue because they believe any action that furthers God's plan are justified. Besides, for humanity to be a true collective, a difference of worldview cannot be allowed. But ironically, their goal of a collective implicitly frames their society as more egalitarian than chaos is, since everyone should theoretically be equal under God. The leaders, like the Messiah and the angels, are effectively used as a mouthpiece for God, prior to a broader social understanding of God's will. In fact, in many games, when a law society is achieved, there isn't even a direct divine presence, such as Shin Megami Tensei 2, when Gabriel leaves because her job is done. The most obvious inspiration for law is the United States in critiquing its role as a world police. 
We've gone over a lot of issues that the Japanese people had with the US in the past, but it should be said that these issues are still ongoing. Even though for the most part, United States no longer occupies the country, there's currently 54,000 US military personnel stationed in Japan, so they are still pretty present. Still, today, the United States has 31 military bases on Okinawa, which takes up about 15% of the island. Historically, these soldiers would have been a real danger to the locals. In 1949, just four years after the war ended, Time Magazine reported 16 robberies, 33 assaults, 29 murders, and 18 rape cases by American soldiers in just a six-month period from April to September. Furthermore, since the US was acting as an imperialist power, it had rules in place making it so American soldiers who committed crimes in these countries were to be tried by the US, not the local country. This forms a sort of existential threat because even if they're acting on Japanese territory, Americans often aren't held accountable to the Japanese. This makes it an issue of sovereignty. In Shin Megami Tensei 1, this conflict is represented by Ambassador Thorman and the American troops in Wupongi. Their presence is most memorable for launching nuclear ICBMs at Tokyo, a dual reference to both of the bombs being dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and a scene in Devilman when Russia launches a hydrogen bomb at its own city, Surengran, to stop the spread of demons. This ties to the utilitarian themes of law. For law, acts of mass murder such as this are essentially a trolley problem. In this case, Thorman is asking if you're willing to kill X amount of people in Tokyo, if it would save Y amount of people across the world from an incoming demon invasion. It's actually weirdly fitting, considering this is a real talking point for American apologists who argue in favor of the bombs being dropped in World War II. This is taken further with the Thousand Year Kingdom, because it takes that notion of killing X to save Y and adds saving Z in the future by creating a peaceful world. This brings us to the religious makeup of law. On a surface level, it would appear that law is chiefly represented by Christianity. After all, the elder of Messiah has crosses and his will is imposed by archangels. However, this is not actually true. In universe, when law deities are referred to by ethnicity, they're called Hebrew gods. Likewise, even though Thorman is used to represent law, the majority of the concepts referenced to by law figures is either from some form of esoteric Judaism or is used broadly across Abrahamic religions. For instance, the concept of the Messiah was originally from apocalyptic Jewish scripture in the book of Isaiah. It states that in the future, a man from the line of legendary King David will lead a Jewish people and guide the world to an age of peace, commonly referred to as the Messianic Age. This line of thought found a resurgence of popularity during Jesus' lifetime, while the Jews were under Roman rule. That said, SMT2's depiction of the Messiah does seem to be largely referencing Christianity. However, it's worth noting the Order of Messiah doesn't believe that a specific person must be the Messiah. In Shin Megami Tensei 1 alone, they prop up two different messiahs over the course of the game. Likewise, Shin Megami Tensei 1 is unique in its depiction of law not strictly being represented by Abrahamic religion. It features the Norse deity Thor and the Hindu deity Vishnu, incarnated as Krishna. Vishnu is easy to explain, as he presides over the preservation of the universe. To do so, he manifests on Earth as avatars to defend the Dharma, a Sanskrit word meaning religious law. Now, Thor is a little more complicated. Some think that Ambassador Thorman is meant to be a reference to Harry Truman, the US president who approved of the atomic bombs being dropped on Japan. But this was confirmed not to be the case by Ryotaro Ito, the writer for Shin Megami Tensei 1, who stated it was merely a coincidence. For one, the name Thor works as a reference to the PGM-17 Thor, the United States' first operational ballistic missile. Likewise, Thorman launching the ICBMs is equated to the biblical destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Thor's hammer drops divine fire on the city of Tokyo, which is fitting because in the Bible, God's judgment is sometimes depicted as lightning. Thor works for a similar reason that chaos gods work as demons. To Christian missionaries, we can see rival religions as less of a real system of beliefs and more of a tool. They would sometimes identify popular local deities with their god in order to more easily convey Christianity to them. 
This practice occurred throughout the Americas and similarly with the Scandinavian people, specifically for Thor, his hammer Mjolnir is sometimes equated to the cross. It's also possible that they meant to have Yahweh represent the archetypical chief god or sky father, where with Thor, he represents Odin. Likewise with Echidna, he could represent Zeus, with the Christian demonization being identified with Zeus sealing enemy gods within the pit of Tartarus. Funnily enough, Thorman's title of ambassador is wordplay because in Japanese, the word ambassador is Taishi. The word for ambassador or Taishi is one stroke away from the word Tenshi or angel. This is because the original meaning of the word angel was messenger. Biblically speaking, angels were largely used by God to convey his will to humans. Now one topic I sort of dodged talking about so far in regards to the order of Messiah is the inspiration for their organization. And that's because it opens a whole new can of worms. They have an aesthetic based around esoteric Christianity, chiefly influenced by the poor fellow soldiers of Christ and the Temple of Solomon, also known as the Knights Templar. These were an order of knights formed in 1118 to protect Christians making a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. But what made them unique was their status as a monastic order. The members all took oaths of chastity, obedience, and poverty, which made them seem more reliable. While being involved in the Crusades might make you immediately think of soldiers, they are much more notable for their role in European economics, arguably founding Europe's first banking system. Right after they were founded, the Templars received backing for the church Father St. Bernard of Clairvaux, founder of the Cistician Order, leading to them receiving a surge of donations from the broader Catholic community. They quickly grew to become an international organization spreading all over Europe. The Templars offered loans, accepting deposits, and kept records across branches. Who better to secure your money than one of the strongest militaries on that side of the globe? The Templars became so successful that not only did they serve as bankers for multiple royal families, they financed the Second Crusades and bought the entire island of Cyprus. However, this success quickly faded along with the Crusades. In 1307, King of France Philip IV accused the order of a series of trumped up charges including heresy, various sexual acts, and worshipping an idol of Baphomet. These charges were widely considered to be fabricated even at the time, but he's the King of France so all of the Templars in the country were arrested and had tortured confessions out of them. Following a long trial period, Pope Clement V dissolved the order, but the Grand Master of the Knights Templar Jacques de Molay refused to accept guilt and was burned at the stake in March of 1314. The Order of Messiah shares many parallels with the Knights Templar. Most obvious is the Messiah unit literally named Templar Knight. Its description given in Shimigami Tensei 1's Game Boy Advance port also reflects the real life history of the Templars saying, the Knight Order was originally created for defense. Now however, they obey all orders to spread the messiah faith. Likewise, the group's fall from grace is reflected in Shimigami Tensei 2, as the center strays from God's will with the elders choosing to work with demons like Belphegor. This connection between the Order of Messiah and the Knights Templar goes even deeper when we start talking about their legacy. All of the mystique surrounding the Templars created an atmosphere ripe for a swell of unsubstantiated conspiracies and superstitions especially since they were accused of having secret religious initiation rites. Just one month after de Molay was executed, Pope Clement V died. Then again in November of the same year, Philip IV did as well. Hundreds of years later, when Louis XVI was executed during the French Revolution, it's said that someone jumped onto the guillotine stand and shouted, Jacques de Molay, you are avenged. This created the rumor of the Templar's curse, and the idea that they were still secretly around behind the scenes pulling strings in Europe. This is compounded with the Templar's relation to the legendary Israelite king, Solomon. Some believe that the Templars may have found the Ark of the Covenant or the Holy Grail. These latter claims are often conflated with their supposed idol worship as their idol to Baphomet was said to have been a life-sized head that could make land fertile. To this day, rumors of the Templars continue to evolve and have been conflated and intertwined with groups like the Freemasons, who readily accept these claims because it bolsters their legitimacy and mysticizes their public image. 
The Order of Messiah is meant to embody this sort of secret society. This is explicitly shown through the Messiah units Magus and Adept, which are respectively from Shimigami Tensei 1 and 2. These names are actually titles from the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, a very influential secret society founded in 1887 that included the loser Alistair Crawley in its membership. In the context of their role as representing US imperialism, the Messiahs also represent the New World Order. Law is quite literally depicted as an authoritarian, collectivist conspiracy by the quote-unquote Hebrew gods. It's even introduced in the series by Goto as secretly plotting to destroy the city of Tokyo. We can see this even more clearly in Shin Megami Tensei 2, where law demons are related to 666, the mark of the beast from Revelation, which is sometimes identified with the New World Order conspiracy. Similarly, Law's goals can be viewed as transhumanist, which is often framed as a goal of secret societies. The Order of the Messiah has a history of using technology to tamper with humans, such as the bioengineered messiahs of Shimigami Tensei 2. However, it doesn't start there. In Shimigami Tensei 1's GBA port, the messiah unit scanner is described saying, very powerful psychics who use psychokinesis. Their brains were tampered with to unlock their special abilities. This left them emotionally unbalanced and with ruined personalities. Likewise, in Shimigami Tensei 2's art for Shimigami Tensei 1's law hero, he's shown with his hat off, revealing a number of scars across his bald head, and that they have been stapled shut along with the identifier No Zero. This is because the law hero was a prototype for the Messiah Project. These changes represent not just obedience, but the removal of free will, where you lose what makes you a person. The same can be broadly said for the law society, where all humanity acts under one banner. While humanity doesn't necessarily become a singularity, it's true that law societies are framed as being a homogenous blob of humankind. This in turn represents a loss of social identity and is meant to give off the feeling that is distinctly alien. This ties back to Law's role as American, where they represent people who are literally foreigners. Obviously, obviously, early in Shin Megami Tensei 1, Law is literally represented by foreign government. The American soldiers you see in the game are depicted as speaking poor Japanese. Later in Shin Megami Tensei 2, Law is depicted as having deceived and divided the Japanese people, represented by Amatsu and Kunitsukami. This brings us to Neutral, the final ending. This one is kind of hard to discuss because unlike the other alignments, it's not very present in the plot. SMT1, like most mainline games, features no choice specifically for a neutral ending. And after the Great Cataclysm, there's not even a neutral aligned group. There is a reason for this but it goes against everything we've discussed so far. As an alignment, Neutral enjoys a blatant bias that's baked into the logic of the series. Let me explain. Throughout the series, the conflict between Law and Chaos put the lives of countless people at risk. The Great Cataclysm alone presumably killed millions, not to mention the subsequent demon invasion. So in a practical sense, Neutral as political action exists in response to Law and Chaos, the same could be said for their ideology. In SMT1's neutral ending, it's argued that while both Law and Chaos have strong points, they're far too extreme. Without a balanced society, everyone's day-to-day -day lives will be ruined. This dichotomy was likely inspired, in part, by the political science book, A Discourse by Three Drunkards on Government, by Nobuko Tsukui, under the pen name Nakai Chomen, Chomen meaning all the people. The book is framed as a conversation between three characters, the gentleman, a democratic pacifist with a European view of ethics, the champion, a Japanese imperialist, and Master Nankai, the moderator. Over the course of the night, the gentleman argues with the champion, until the end of the debate when Master Nankai joins in and refutes them both, arguing that the gentleman's ideas are purely theoretical while the champions are outdated and impractical. Nankai argues in favor of a practical constitution based on the best policies already held by Western countries. Similarly, in SMT1, Neutral is very openly meant to be centrist and cherry picks different aspects from the other alignments that it likes. This is the key to how Neutral is treated uniquely in the series. 
Atlas does not see it as a side in the same way Law and Chaos are. It is literally neutrality, while Law and Chaos are extremes meant to be avoided. However, even if not politically, neutral can still be described in terms of themes, specifically humanity and hope. Hope, because neutral in part, represents an uncertain future. You don't side with either movement, leading you to fight both sides of the conflict. It represents humanity because you're fighting for the people in a way that will materially help them, rather than fighting specifically for your ideals. Also, if you pay attention you'll notice that all of the neutral figures in SMT1 are essentially deified humans. Tai Shang Lao Zhang, Steven, En No Ozuno, and Masakaro. Steven and Masakaro are notable here because Steven is a reference to theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking, who argued that the universe wasn't created by a god. Masakaro, however, represents freedom, having led the first rebellion against Japan's central government in Kyoto. Further, by rejecting law and chaos, you're also rejecting their religions. Your loyalty is towards the people, not any god. This also ties into the theme of hope. Since demons are ideas, by rejecting them, you're no longer restricted by certain ways of life. Of course, because you have no god, you don't receive outside help. All mankind has is each other. And Neutral treasures this hard work because it's you commanding your future. Kazuyuki Yamai, director of numerous Megaten games, discusses this in the SMT4 Apocalypse art book, saying, Following the point of view that people's belief is the proof for the existence and strength of gods and demons, we can see a sort of symbiotic relationship. However, as human civilization develops, people end up wanting to live without being bound by anything. But on the other hand, there is also the fragile future, which makes us wonder whether humans can actually live independently. This line of thought is inspired by the Nietzschean theme, God is Dead. The philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche argued that with the Enlightenment, that science had progressed to a point where belief in God was nonsensical, and that this would increasingly become a more common viewpoint. Furthermore, since Western logic and morality are based on Christian preconceptions, this would shatter many people's worldviews, leaving them in despair. However, the non-existence of God could open up a whole new, exhilarating world of freedom. To this end, Nietzsche posited the Ubermensch, a person who would serve as the model for this new lease on life, and inspire society to follow in their footsteps. They would be juxtaposed with Christian ethics that uphold the weak by representing strength and pride. This was because Nietzsche believed that Christianity's egalitarianism was based in supernatural ethics, rather than what was materially beneficial. This theme becomes more clear when we look back at how the alignments are framed through the cycle. Law and chaos can most easily be related to the Hindu view of a universal cycle. In Hinduism, the universe is presided over by the Trimurti, the trio of gods, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, which respectively create, preserve, and destroy. It must be said that here, Shiva's destruction is not negative, but actually positive, because it's needed for a new creation. Of course, law and chaos are respectively preservation and destruction, and we see here that they're meant to work in tandem. This is what Lucifer is saying in the epilogue of SMT1's Chaos Ending, when he describes himself as a part of God. They can't exist in a vacuum, they are necessarily locked together and sourced from the other. While this explains the metaphysical side of it, the Buddhist view of the cycle informs the neutral ending. As we went over before, the samsara is the cycle of rebirth that is defined by suffering, stoked by internal desires. One can only be displaced by quenching all of their desires. This state is otherwise known as nirvana. In this context, law and chaos are illusions that are holding you and broader society back from enlightenment. Neutral exists outside of the cycle as they realize the harm caused by the other two. This explains Steven's depiction in the series. He is a character that has reached Nirvana in universe and gained the ability to hear the Great Will, which again is literally the thoughts of mankind. It is the will of the people. Further, within Buddhism, there's a doctrine called the Middle Way, which explains that the Buddha's path to enlightenment required rejecting extremes. This included luxury and asceticism, and even the notions of existence and non-existence. In SMT4 Apocalypse, Stephen openly refers to the endings, which are both neutral, as the middle path, in opposition to law and chaos. Likewise, these Buddhist themes mesh with Gnosticism. This was a branch of Christianity that believes the God of the Old Testament isn't actually the highest being in the universe. The Jewish God, here known as the Demiurge, ignorant of any power beyond itself, created matter using pre-existent divine essence, trapping what would-be spirits into physical bodies. 
Like Buddhists, Gnostics believed in a cycle of reincarnation. However, for Gnostics, salvation from the cycle comes through realizing the divine spark within yourself. Receiving this true knowledge, or Gnosis, allows one to once again become fully spirit, away from the grasp of the Demiurge. This is why, across the entire Megami Tensei franchise, some version of the Abrahamic God presides over the cycle. They are acting in part as Demiurge, once again blocking the player from realizing existence beyond itself. This also relates to SMT's theme of character growth through choice. In this context, that is Gnosis, finding the true self, which in SMT is strongly associated with neutral. This is because in universe, it's seen as an act of rebellion, and more than that, free thinking. If you'll notice, unlike those from other alignments, many neutral characters from across the series will tell the player to go with their heart, implying that they're okay with you not agreeing with them. A good example of this is Aradia from SMT Nocturne, who even acknowledges an enemy trying to murder her host. Often, these characters aren't even presented as neutral. For instance, take SMT1's En no Ozono, the spirit in charge of the Kongo Kai, or the Diamond Realm. This is a reference to the Kongo Kai Mandala, which in Vajrayana Buddhism represents Vairokana, the Cosmic Buddha, in its fullness. The very name Diamond is meant to call to the irrevocable, eternal truth of the universe. Practitioners of the faith meditate on this mandala to identify themselves with Vairokana, and in the game, En no Ozono is there to help the player return to the Earth 30 years after the nukes hit. However, in the SMT1 fanbook, it's said that he was motivated to aid the player because the balance of the Diamond Realm is tied to that of the physical world. And what is this balance? This brings us back to Kichi Joji, where the alignments are first introduced by an old man who tells the player, light and darkness, law and chaos. The delicate balance that this world rides on is beginning to tip. While the forces of law and chaos that are in motion now are still weak, there will come a time soon where they shall gain power and momentum, vying for supremacy over each other. However, it matters not on which side the weight falls. Either way, the result will be the same, a scale unbalanced. This character is later revealed to be Taisheng Laozhang, one of the highest deities in Taoism. Taoism is a religion that centers around the idea that everything in the universe is interconnected while also in a state of flux. This is embodied in the Tao, which translates to path or way. Here, the word way is used metaphorically to represent guidance. Similar to Kabbalah's Ein Sof, the Tao is believed to be the indescribable source of all things. Through its nothingness, infinite outcomes are possible. Creation and the maintenance of the universe occurs through shifts between yin and yang, opposing forces that complement each other, forming a natural balance. The ultimate goal for the Taoist is to reach harmony with the universe. Realizing the Tao enables the ability to act effortlessly without thinking. This is called Wu Wei, or non-action, where the user flows with nature and it simply guides them towards the best action. Here, Taisheng Laozhang is literally acting as the embodiment of nature, telling the player that the universe needs balance. This Taoist lens is very important to note because even though in some of these frameworks, law and chaos are needed for the cosmos to function, in the universe, they don't actually mean the endings. Law and chaos in this context simply refer to vague ideals in a broader philosophy. This is gestured at in the Strange Journey reminiscence quote from earlier, which said, These all normally maintain equilibrium, which is known as the force that makes the will of the earth evolve. And equilibrium obviously means neutral. It's made most clear in the 18th visionary item from SMT2's GBA port, Silver Necktie, where Steven says, it may be normal for those siding with law, but once law gets out of control, things naturally revert back to chaos. Of course, it works the other way around too. If chaos gets too strong, law will only get stronger. People advance, hanging on to a subtle balance. Hmm, how can I say it? Maybe it would be best to say that they need to achieve balance to advance in the first place. Here, Stephen openly states that neutral is the only way for a society to progress. The games do not see the law and chaos endings as real feasible options. Again, they are extremes to be avoided. Law and chaos are only meant to be good in the context of neutral, where you pick and choose specific law and chaos concepts deemed useful. Funnily enough, this actually fits exactly how alignments work on a mechanical level. In the game's programming, alignment is tracked on a linear chart from 0, law, to 255, chaos 
and neutral between 112 and 143. You're only supposed to work within the approved values, and going too far in either direction spells disaster. From the evidence, it's very apparent that it was on purpose. Even Devilman had this theme of humanity needing to band together to fight against the demons and reject authoritarian fear-mongering in order to progress society. This forms a core issue in the series and continues to plague it to this day. Regardless of how you feel politically, seriously think about this. What is even the point of offering three choices and touting this as giving the player agency in a philosophical debate? All the while, the creator of the question is clearly biased. This is no longer an issue of canon or amount of content. Shin Megami Tensei says you can pick what you want. You are all that matters. This is your destiny. You must take it and shape it yourself. But also, you should probably pick what it wants you to pick. Because only within that can you have what you want in a way that it thinks is best for you. And all I can ask is how staff have the gall to say something like, a correct way of thinking and definitive ending do not exist in the Mega Ten series.